All right. Well, good morning, everybody, and happy Sabbath. I appreciate everybody being here, or those that are here. Uh, there's a few, but I'm sure they all got nice smiles. I can see them. And thank you to everyone that is uh, appearing or streaming with us live. So you can see uh, this particular lesson that we're going to have, and we appreciate you joining us. And it's an honor and a privilege once again to be here before you uh, to do this lesson study. And uh, <clears throat> let's go ahead and go to the lesson study. As was mentioned just moments ago, we are in lesson number eight. Lesson number eight. And the title of this particular lesson is The Sabbath and the End. The Sabbath and the End. Obviously, it's something that we always hear about, right? When we, uh, as Seventh-day Adventists, we always talk about the Sabbath. Uh, why? I mean, one of the, the terms in our, our name that signifies us as, as, a, as a religion is the Seventh Day, right? Seventh Day Adventist. So Sabbath is very important to us. And so let's go to the memory text that we have from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9 from the New King James Version. That's the one I'll be reading. Oh, by the way, uh, we do have uh, any individuals that are present here. We do have a Spanish class, and I think we have it right over there in the other room. And Brother Padron will be doing that. All right, um, the memory text. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. So that's our memory text uh, for this morning and for this particular lesson study of this week. And again, the focus is on the Sabbath and the end. So let's focus first on the Sabbath and why the Sabbath is important. Uh, to us as individuals, uh, not just as Seventh-day Adventists, but to everybody uh, in humankind, uh, the Sabbath is very important because it signifies creation. Uh, one of the things that makes us unique as individuals is because we were created by God, and as created beings, we obviously have value to God. Uh, why would God create us if we had no value? Think about that. Uh, it's one of the things that we should be thinking about when we uh, do our worship. What's the purpose? How many of us have always had that question in mind uh, throughout our lives is what is our purpose in life? And at times we forget that because we are so tied up in the many things that we do in life, uh, our work, our family obligations, and other things that come up. But God uh, made us. And he gave us worth, and we should not forget that we all have worth, whether we're very young, middle-aged, <laughs> um, those individuals that may have some disabilities or other problems, each individual, each human being has worth, uh, especially to God who created each of us. Not only did he create us, he created us in whose image? In his image. So uh, why is he going to create somebody that is in his image if he's not going to put any value on that particular individual's uh, and their life? Um, <clears throat> what I like that was said here in the book of Acts, chapter 17, it says, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, and he has made from one blood every nation of men, to dwell on all the face of the earth. So where does God dwell? Everywhere, right? He doesn't just dwell in a building, and I hope we don't put that type of limitation on our God. He is everywhere. But not only that, he, he has made one blood of every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. What does that signify to all of us? One blood, every nation of men. That means we're all in the same family, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that is very important and significant these, this time and day of age. We forget that. We forget that we're one blood, one nation created by one God. There are so many disputes arguments and things that are happening, not just locally, in the state, nationally, and in the world, internationally. 
so many individuals forget that we are created beings to be in one family as children of one God. <clears throat> and always remember that we are all unique, right? There's only one of us. As far as I know, there's only one Julio. Of course, I had a client once that said, when he got caught on a video doing something he shouldn't have, he said that we all have twins in the world and they're evil. Um, of course, that didn't work very well for that particular case um, because he was wearing the same shirt and the same hat um, when he went to the hearing that was on the video. So that was a little hard to explain um, that we all have twins that look alike, uh, and yet he was the good one and the other one was the evil one. But anyway, we are one of a kind, creations, unique in every way, um, but yet, even with our uniqueness uh, and our differences, we still should find ways to get along. And one of the ways we do is by worshiping our God, the one God, the one true God, the creator of everything, of heaven and earth, and all that is in it. All right, so let's go ahead and um, <clears throat> I want to kind of skip over Sunday's lesson for just a moment. And I want to go actually to Monday's lesson uh, first and foremost, because in this one we're talking about Sabbath and creation. You know, the world definitely needs uh, something um, to cling on to nowadays because we have so many things that we're being pulled in so many different directions by so many things, whether you see things on Yahoo, uh, TikTok, YouTube, whatever it may be, it seems like there's so much diversity and differences, but yet there's nothing that keeps us in common. And so I think what's very important is individuals that believe in a God, a one God, a true God, you know, we've got to give reassurance to individuals, to the world, uh, because what are we supposed to be doing, my brothers and sisters? We're supposed to be making disciples of the world, and so we've got to have something to go with. But okay, so let's go to Sabbath, and why is Sabbath important? So why don't we actually go uh, to Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, uh, and I'll go ahead and read that since we only have a few individuals here before me. And so I'm going to re be reading for the New King James Version, Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3. So here we go. Genesis 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. All right, so here we are. From the very beginning in the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, we have an account of the Lord, the God, the one that we worship, creating the heaven and earth and everything in it, and he did something significant here. What day did he mention uh, in this particular verses or these particular verses of the scripture what day is mentioned there the seventh day did he say the first day second day the third day the fourth day the fifth day the sixth day no he said the seventh day on the seventh day he ended his work so he worked for the six days and on the seventh day he rested now i'm not going to get into all the uh theological aspects behind did god really need to rest on the seventh day no, we're not here for that particular discussion. But on the seventh day, he rested. But he did also something important besides rest on the seventh day. What was in the verses that we, we just read, verses 1 through 3, that's significant about the seventh day other than the Lord rested on the seventh day? He blessed it and sanctified it. Now, did he do that for any of the other days? Now, we don't have an account of the Lord blessing any of the other six days uh, that we have, but he did bless and sanctify the seventh day uh, because he rested from all his work, which he had done and created. So there we have from the Lord himself a special significance given and labeled onto the seventh day, the Sabbath. He blessed it and sanctified it which is the only day that he's done that. Yes, he did other work, and he created everything else, but the special significance of the seventh day is that he blessed it and sanctified it. 
Uh, we'll read later on that he made it holy as well. And so this is important. So now you have something that's set out in particular uh, on the Sabbath. It is a day that is blessed and sanctified. And so this is important because when we go now to Exodus, and I'm just going to pick from Exodus because we have in our lesson study Exodus and Deuteronomy, uh, Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, and they're both referring back to the same thing, um, the Ten Commandments, in particular the Fourth Commandment. So why don't we just go uh, straight to Exodus 20, and I'll just read from there. Exodus 20, starting at verse 8. All right, so Exodus 20, verse 8, and it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember, he blessed it, he sanctified it, and now you have to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, just like the Lord did. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger stranger who is within your gates. So nobody there should be doing anything, right? <clears throat> For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. We've heard that already, right? In Genesis, the sea and that that is in them and rested the seventh day. Where have we heard that again? Rested on the seventh day. Where did we just hear that? In Genesis, once again, in Genesis 2, he rested. On the seventh day, therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and hodled it. So he blessed it. It's blessed again, right? We've heard that in Genesis. So we have that in Genesis, and now we have it in Exodus and Deuteronomy. It's essentially the same thing uh, that we have on there. So there is special significance, once again, to the Sabbath day, the seventh day, the one where the Lord rested, that he blessed, he sanctified it, made it holy, and he rested on it. <clears throat> And so why, why do we do these kind of things? You hear sometimes some individuals saying, especially to us in, in our particular faith, um, why do you keep the Sabbath? Aren't you being a little legalistic? No pun intended for what I do, right? Um, but <laughs> um, have any of you heard that before? Uh, that... We are being a little legalistic in keeping the Sabbath and honoring and keeping it, uh, in other words, not working and not doing anything, but actually resting and, and uh, worshiping on that particular day. I've heard it. I've heard it many times. I've had individuals have that discussion with me um, about the particulars of the seventh day and say, you know, why, why do you keep the Sabbath? You're, you're being hyper-technical. Uh, which is kind of curious to me because whenever we look at that, the question that we always get is only about the Sabbath. Uh, I, I don't get any questions about thou shall not kill, thou shall not steal. Uh, will we be a little hyper-technical if we say, no, I don't think I want to go ahead and keep that particular commandment. Uh, it doesn't apply to me. Um, if I keep that commandment, I'm being legalistic. Uh, <laughs> You know, this is what I'm talking about. Sometimes we get into these kind of discussions with individuals, and we got to be careful in the way we discuss these things uh, with the individuals to make them understand in a way that makes sense. Uh, not just go and say, hey, we keep the Sabbath because that's what we're supposed to do. <laughs> um, that's what parents tell children, right? You tell children, hey, don't do that because you're not supposed to do that. Uh, but at some point, the children get older and going to say, Why? Why? And uh, uh, that's the, the most chilling question that we all get. You get many questions, but the why questions are always the very chilling ones. And sometimes as parents, we get stuck and say, oh, go, okay, I'm a little bit in trouble here. I might not be able to explain it. But we've got to get an account. And as I spoke several weeks ago, we've got to be uh, able to defend our religion and our faith and, and give reason for it. And this is one of those. So we've got to go back to the Sabbath. Why is it important? It's an eternal symbol of our rest in Jesus Christ. Uh, we are, it's a sign of loyalty to our creator. 
because he is the creator. He created everything. He made everything that goes. It speaks to God who achieved everything for us because we can really never do anything on our own. It is a symbol of rest, not of works. Okay, we got to be careful about that because sometimes we can get tied up in keeping the Sabbath and making it more of an obligation and a chore and forgetting what the Sabbath is really about. And that's why sometimes individuals have that question for us and say, hey, you're being hyper-technical, you're being legalistic, um, because sometimes when we, and this has been mentioned before, when we talk about the Sabbath, what do you hear a lot of times from the Sabbath, sometimes individuals saying, oh, you can't do much on the Sabbath, right? You can't go to the mall. You can't go to a restaurant. You can't do this. You can't do that. Um, they are looking at the Sabbath in a way that I, I think is negatively, unfortunately. And, and that's why we get individuals asking these type of questions. Uh, so I've kind of turned things in my own life as well to look at things, as they say, the glass half full instead of half empty. In other words, look at it more positive. There's so many other things that we can do. Uh, so we do not want to look as keeping the Sabbath as a chore, as an obligation. It is something that should be a delight, as a rest in our Lord and God, um, in an opportunity to spend time with God and to spend time with each other as well so we can all be uplifted. After all, how, how many of us have really tough weeks during the week? I'm raising my hand. I raise it every week. Every day of those six days has been really tough. But when I come to the Sabbath, come in through those doors, what a relief. I am here on the Blessed and Holy Sabbath. I'm well, actually starting on uh, Friday evening, actually. I start feeling that way. But once I walk in here, it feels even, even better uh, to see each of you here and to have the discussion. But, you know, it's not a, it's, the Sabbath is not legalistic. It's, it's a form of grace. Uh, grace that God gave to us in a, grace, uh, in a form of assurance, not of condemnation. It's in a way that we can now depend on the Lord to take all our worries away. And, and that's what's going to happen. It's an eternal link that we have between the Eden that was and that will be. So we have something that's going to put us together, right? We all know that the Eden that was there is no longer there, but it will be, and it will come back, and that's the link that we have, and it's the Sabbath, because the Sabbath has been something that has been there since the beginning. Was it something that just came up recently? No, it's just something that has been there and always will be there, but it's our unbroken connection to the time for our creation, and so let us not forget the importance of the Sabbath and why, how this came about with creation. You know, it was created by God for each and every one of us, and he is the Lord of the Sabbath. So why is this important, and why are we having this discussion in our lesson study? Um, I could just end there and say, hey, that's it. You know, we're here on the Sabbath. We're here to worship our Lord and God. Uh, let us do so in happiness and in joy, and then move on. But there's something else that's happening, all right? And throughout this whole study, for this quarter, it's been discussed. Uh, many of us have mentioned it while we've been up here talking about it. There is something called the Great Controversy, right? Anybody heard about the Great Controversy? I hope everybody says yes. <laughs> or am I the only one? Mm, I doubt it. I'm not the only individual here. So there is something else that's happening uh, in the world. So we have the Sabbath. We have creation. It points back to our Creator, to our Redeemer, to our Savior. But going to Tuesday's lesson, we have something interesting that's happening. Uh, we have a deception that's happening. That's why we have what's called the great controversy. Uh, and sometimes you'll see that pointed out in certain ways. Sometimes uh, I used to hear it all the time, uh, you know, on your shoulders are, are angels. There's one angel that's telling you the good and the other angel is telling you the bad. One whispering good things, one whispering bad things. And so we have the conflict that's happening, and that's the great controversy that's happening and conflict that's happening with each and every one of us. And so going to Tuesday's lesson, we have a, what they call a counterfeit. And what's, what's a counterfeit? 
Anybody know what counterfeit is? Something that looked like the original, but is not the original, right? Okay, so that's exactly right. Sometimes you hear about that in the forms of money, right? Sometimes you'll have individuals trying to counterfeit money. Uh, it's not real. Uh, it's not the original. And it's fake, essentially. So we have a counterfeit. And the counterfeit that is being propagated throughout the world and has gained momentum uh, for quite some time uh, has been something called evolution. Has anybody ever heard the evolution? We kind of hear that all the time. Um, you know, I'm not going to talk about the, the other counterfeit that goes with that. Uh, that you got to remember, and this is important to remember with, with Satan, he is very conniving, um, he, but he's very intelligent, a uh, very intelligent being uh, who is actually hitting all of us on, on multiple levels. So one level is having us uh, worship or having individuals worship on, on Sunday uh, instead of on Saturday or Sabbath. But this other one is, is another front that he's attacking humanity, which is evolution. And the process behind evolution is that we evolve. When we have evolved over the course of millions and millions of years uh, to who we are now as individuals, as human beings. And of course, that takes time. And that actually would not harmonize with what is mentioned in the biblical account of creation. Uh, <clears throat> so why don't we go to the book of Psalms um, 33. The book of Psalms 33. And starting on verse 6, 33, verse 6. And again, okay, this is going to go back to the creation uh, and who created. It says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. Again, what we read in Genesis, who is the creator? God, right? So this points back to the Lord. It says, by his word, the heavens were made and hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. He is a creator. He created everything. He spoke, right? He spoke, and it, it came about. It was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Thank you so much, Brother Sister Ruth. Um, <clears throat> and on verse 9, he says, for he spoke. There it is, what you just mentioned. And it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. That's exactly what you were just mentioning in verse 9. So this is important. So the Lord is a creator. He spoke and it came about. Um, and he, he came about and created all of this. And if we remember what we just talked about in Genesis 2, that he did so in what? How many days? Six days. I'm holding up correct number. Six days, right? Six days. Um, but evolution has a different spin on that, right? Evolution says, no, it didn't happen in six days. It happened over time, over millions and millions of years. And so basically Satan is wanting us to believe there is no way that God created everything in six days and rested on the seventh day. It didn't happen that way. It happened this way, through evolution, through time. We came from nothing, and now we are something. And that took a long time to do that. And it's impossible for that to have happened in six days. But we have the word of the Lord telling us that it happened in six days. And he's talking about 24-hour increments. Um, because if we were to believe and try to mesh these and put these things together, in other words, to say there's no way it was six days, so then what would happen? We'd have to literally believe that each of those days was how long? An impossibility, right? Because if he said on the seventh day he rested, and you say, well, you know what, there's no way it could be a literal 24-hour period, well, then how long is each day? A million years? Well, then we should be celebrating Sabbath for a million years, right? We're not going to be working for all those millions of years. What's going to happen? 
it doesn't work. It doesn't work together. And so we have to be very careful about looking at all of this. The biblical account is clear. God spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Can we get a microphone over? Because I think we've got two individuals that want to speak up. Uh, Brother Oscar and Bro Brother Romel that want to talk about this uh, particular evolution. Yeah, if you're saying, you know, the, that theory about the days not being literal, if he created the plants and the trees, and it was like in, in a million years, right? But he doesn't create the sun and the moon till another million years. How could they have survived? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Brother Oscar. And see, this is what I'm talking about. It's illogical. It has no, makes no logical sense to have that type of belief that there, the period of time was no, more than a 24-hour period. If each of them took even a year or 10 years or whatever it is, it would be impossible to put that together. Not only that, uh, the basis behind evolution is always problematic. has always been problematic um, because uh, the belief is it started with a Big Bang, and obviously, anybody that knows about science, you need energy uh, to create a bang. Uh, so where did the energy come from? Uh, you know, so you know, you got to go back all the way to the essence. And I remember watching a documentary, and there were there are actually individuals that are spending millions and millions of dollars trying to go all the way back to create the very first bang. Um, but they said it's, it, they haven't been able to do it in all this time, and if we've existed for millions of years and we yet have not able to accomplish this, that kind of lets us know that it's impossible because it's not really true. Um, my question to each of these individuals that come up to me sometimes when I talk to them about, or they talk to me about evolution, uh, that you know, we were created from nothing, I, I tell them, you know what, there's a oil spot on my driveway, I'm waiting for it to turn into a Lamborghini, but it yet hasn't happened, you know? so. And this is what I'm talking about. It's not going to happen, and it will never happen that it's going to turn into a vehicle uh, and evolve eventually because it's impossible, my brothers and sisters. It's not going to happen, and that's why we believe in the true uh, one and only creator God. Uh, Brother Romel? was suggesting that, hey, uh, it's possible that, you know, both things, both creation and evolution happen, that God created, but things evolve over time. So we have to be really careful. And, and, and the, the core message of, of this and, and the Sabbath is that God is creator, no one else. And he creates out of nothing. And evolution, it's a theory, right? Okay. You know, a lot of science is based on the, of that, which is a theory, and in science, evolution doesn't even make sense to scientists because in science, everything has to be proven. And so out of nothing came something. So I always tell people, it takes a lot more faith to, to, to believe in evolution that, than it is to believe in a big God in the sky, right? Because you're saying that out of nothing came something. At least I'm starting with out of one who's always existed came something. It takes a lot of faith. It, it's still faith. It's not a proven thing. It's, it's faith. <coughs> Either it's faith in God or faith in out of nothing came something. Hey Amen. Thank you very much, Brother Romel. That's absolutely right. Um, it's very difficult to, to... I'm sorry, go ahead, Sister Ruth. Just taking the next verse on that page in our quarterly, in Hebrews 11, verse 3. It's a beautiful thing. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. He, he created it from nothing. That's right. He spoke. He, as you mentioned earlier, he spoke and it happened. Uh, and so that's why he created something out of nothing. And so we are created beings in his image. Uh, and so we should not forget that. And the, the problem with the evolution, uh, as Brother Romel pointed out, is a hypothesis. Uh, there is still so much missing from that particular hypothesis to prove it up. 
we, we still have accounts of individuals saying there's the missing links. The missing links are what? If it evolved, then everything should match up. In other words, if you have a bug suddenly turning into a human being, well, you should have links putting it all together. And they are something called missing links, right? And the missing links are because they're missing. It doesn't exist. Um, and so there is a big problem with uh, the evolution. And the, the subtlety about this and, and, and the counterfeit and, and what is happening with Satan is, as I mentioned, he's hitting us on all fronts, is this particular hypothesis with evolution came about about the same time that we were getting into in 1844. I believe they said the first draft uh, of um, Darwin, Darwinism started around 1844, 1845. How <laughs> uh, coincidental uh, that it happened around the same time period um, that much of what we were discussing in our faith and our religion, 1844, uh, that it happened around the same time period. Go ahead, Pastor. The basic principle of Darwinism is survival of the fittest. <clears throat> that means that God used death as a means of creation. That means he used death because the strong animals kill and eat the little ones that can't survive as well, that are not as, as able to overcome. And therefore, uh, this means that millions and billions and billions of deaths occurred in order to bring about what we have now today. It makes God into some kind of a monster, you know? But how could he use death, cruelty, and suffering as a means of creating this world that we live in? It's, it's just totally against what, what we believe. Amen. Go ahead, sir. Another thing is how beautiful it is, the way creation is the center of the fourth commandment. Amen. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. And this is repeated in, in other texts in the Bible, several different places. And what a beautiful thing it is, remembering creation. If, there's no, if we don't believe in creation, forget the Bible. Forget everything. Yeah, absolutely. I think Brother Romel wants to say something else. Uh, <clears throat> this is, uh, you know, Satan attacking the very heart of God's authority. You know, this is, this is what's happening when, when a counterfeit is created. It's to take away from the original. And so we've known that Satan has always been wanting to do that. And that's a great controversy all about. Uh, you know, Satan wants everyone to worship him instead of God, the original, the creator. He is the counterfeit. And so you're going to have that tug of war that is happening uh, and this is what is happening right here with the Sabbath, the creation. It's an attack on creator, the creator of all that um, exists. Go ahead, Brother Ramon. And, and, and just to add to this discussion, and, and, and again, why this is so central, is that because God is creator, he created, and I like how you started with it, he created, no matter what we look like, where we come from, we're all created in the image of God. And so what this ideology has led to, Darwinism, is the creation of the so-called races because that same ideology led scientists to observe different skulls and assume different things based on what they saw and created the races. So they assume the white race was superior and the Asian race, black race, and so forth. So this idea of race is really comes from that same ideology, which is not of God, and I tell people, to worship the creator means worshiping him, understanding that he created all us in his image and that this notion of racial superiority does not exist. We come from different backgrounds to be sure, we have different cultures and upbringings and stuff, all of those things are legitimate. But race is the creation of the devil. And ascribing to racial superiority is is showing that one is not a believer in God because God did not create the races. We did. Humanity did. And that came from a theory of evolution. So when one is subscribing to that belief that this race is more superior, they're more intelligent, that all came from Darwinism, that same belief that's anti-God. Amen. And that goes back to what was mentioned earlier um, when I first started. If you remember, I read from the book of Acts 17, and it says, And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. There you go. You're going back. We're one. We are all one. 
But having these races, this evolution, is creating divisiveness. And what's the most common way to conquer? Divide. And, and this is divisive. This is very divisive uh, in this happening. Not only that, and I'll go to you, Brother Oscar, in just a moment. Not only that, going back to what Pastor said, with evolution, there is a problem. With evolution, you don't have a purpose. All you do is you are born, you go through life, then you die. That's it. Survival of the fittest. Death is the end. There's nothing else after that. There is no hope beyond that. Uh, and that's what is the distinction with our creator. He gives us hope. He redeems us and says there is something more. There's something more that I want from each of you because I created you. I love you. I made you in our, my own image, and I want to spend eternity with you. And so we have a purpose here. Um, but with evolution, there is no purpose. You just are born, you live, you die. If you're the fittest, you survive. If you don't, too bad. That's it. All right. Brother Oscar, you want to say something else? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The acceptance of that, that, um, that way of thinking, of saying that it wasn't literal, is also an attack on the power of the Word of God. Amen. And I always comes to my mind that, that uh, quote from the book Education. In, in the Word of God is the creative energy that called the worlds into existence. Every, this word be, uh, imparts power, it begets life. So, a direct attack on that. And Jesus, the Gospel of John says, in the beginning was the word. And so it's an, a direct attack on the power of God. It says, I was quickened by your word. And then you see in Daniel, when he has those visions in John, when they're, they're weakened and stuff, and they, they're spoken to, and it says, your words have strengthened me. Amen. So it's a direct attack on the power of the word of God because Satan knows how powerful God's word is. Absolutely. <clears throat> he knows that because he was in heaven and he is a created being himself. He was a perfect created being, but he sought more. And, and absolutely, Brother Oscar, that's actually the crux of our lesson study. That's what this is. We know what the Sabbath is, but what Satan is doing is a direct attack on the Sabbath to create something else to take and divert us away from our creator. It's a worship. What it comes down to is worship, my brothers and sisters. This is what it's all about. Are we going to worship God or are we going to worship Satan? He has always wanted worship, that is Satan. He's always wanted it for himself. And he's been trying to take it away since the beginning of time. Uh, and that's why he was cast out of heaven uh, and is now here. And so what he's doing is giving it to us for us to deal with. And that's why it's important that we um, study this and learn it. Uh, sometimes we do just take the Sabbath and creation for granted, um, especially in our faith at times, because we hear it all the time. You know, it gets drowned out because we're hearing it all the time, but it is very significant, my brothers and sisters. That's why I like this quarter lesson and this lesson in particular, because it brings us back, back to the basics of who we are who we're supposed to be, who we're supposed to be worshiping, why is important, why is the Sabbath important, how does it link us together and to each other, um, and because we're obviously going to have to make an account for this, and I mentioned this several weeks ago, each of us will be held accountable uh, to the Lord and our God for that, and that we will find in Sunday's lesson, because I know I had skipped over that, and I apologize because I'm trying to make it sense, sense for myself when I'm reading this lesson study. And so I kind of skipped over that. So let's go back to uh, study um, Sunday's lesson. And it talks about judgment, creation, and accountability. Um, <clears throat> and it's important that we remember uh, we've talked about creation already and, and the importance of God and the Lord and what he did and that he spoke and it came about and it was created. Um, but what's important is with all of this worship, the one thing that we've been trying to emphasize as well and, and has been emphasized for several weeks now uh, by individuals um, is accountability. 
Now, in order to be held accountable, what needs to happen? You need to have a freedom of choice. Right? If somebody tells you and they don't, they're not going to hold you accountable, then there's no choice there. Uh, and that's why this was important. Uh, we are held accountable for our choices that we make, and the gift that the Lord gave us is not only creation and the Sabbath, but another important gift that he gave to each and every one of us is the freedom of choice. Uh, and I spoke about this several weeks ago when I talked about this, that some individuals question why uh, the Lord did not destroy Satan right away at that moment. And the reason being is because he wanted worship out of love, not out of fear. And that's what signifies us and makes us different. And that's the importance behind the freedom of choice is where you have a choice and it's your choice. The Lord is giving you opportunities during your, the course of your life uh, to select and worship him. But if you don't want to, you don't have to. But in the end of time, you are going to have to face him, and you will be accountable for the choices and the decisions that you make. And so the decision and the choices are eternal life or eternal death. Uh, and so he, in his capacity as a loving God, has continually given us choices each and every day to make these decisions, but to choose him as the worship, uh, the one that we worship for all eternity. Um, you know, we don't want to do it out of fear. How, how can you love somebody if you fear them? Okay, and I'm not talking about the biblical fear, all right? I'm talking about the literal fear that we, each of us as human beings have. Think about individuals that are in abusive relationships. Um, they fear the individual, but do you believe they love the individual that's beating them? I doubt it, especially if it can, continues to happen. Uh, if an individual, and I've ex seen those in the course of my career, uh, the individuals will still stay with them, but they stay with them because they're fearful. Uh, and I knew an individual, a young individual that stuck with uh, in an abusive relationship um, because she had fear. She was scared, but she was also deceived. And that's what Satan does, because this young lady was deceived um, by this individual because um, I remember um, speaking with her after she had been beat and had um, actually suffered a concussion. Um, and for a while, she was separated away from this individual, and she was more alive. And uh, the other individuals around her uh, said, yeah, she has changed. But then after several weeks, we realized we started seeing her go back to the way she was before. And, of course, we all had a suspicion and found out that uh, she was back with the individual. And the story that she gave was, well, she said, I went to church, and I was praying, and he was there in the church, the individual that beat her. And so she said, that's a sign that it was meant to be. And I said, no, <laughs> that means he was following you <laughs> kind of thing, you know. Um, those are the kind of things that happen. Um, and so the common terminology that you hear from these individuals is, I will change. They don't change. How many times uh, does an individual have to be beat and say, uh, I will stop beating, um, but yet they continue it? They're not going to change. If the individual themselves does not want to change, there's not much we can do. Um, and so that's where we need to be very careful because Satan wants to lead us into a form where we don't have a choice, that there is no choice. That's why we are surrounded by so many of the other faiths that are worshiping on Sunday. We are outnumbered at this point, my brothers and sisters, in that regard, because he wants us to be forced into taking that up. And what is the future of that? The future is, at some point, that the laws of the country will be enforced, and we will be forced, but we still will have a choice. We still will have a choice at that time, and so you will have to choose at that point, uh, and you will be persecuted. There's no qualms about that. There's nothing hidden about that. It's going to happen, but it's a force. And so that's the difference between God and Satan. 
God does it out of love. He allows you to choose. And what does Satan do? You don't have a choice. I'm going to force you to worship me and to love me. That's a choice for each and every one of us uh, when we go forward um, in our lives. And that is the basis of worship. The conflict, as Brother Oscar said, is the attack on our creator. And it's the form of worship that we have. <clears throat> so let us go now to Wednesday's lesson. And we're going to be spending time in the book of Revelation chapter 14. And so let's go to that book, Revelation chapter 14. And I'll read a few verses from there uh, before I run out of time here. Uh, so Revelation 14, uh, and let's start with verse 7. And I'm sure all of us have heard these, right? Um, and let's go and, head and be reminded of this. And saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made the heavens and the earth, the sea and the springs of the water. Again, it's a call for us to worship God. Is it a call for us to worship Satan? Is it a call for us to worship ourselves? No, it is a call for us to worship him. Him who? God, the creator of what? The heavens and earth and everything in it, including us. So we're going back from Genesis all the way to Revelation. The book of Genesis is the very beginning of the Bible, right? And the book of Revelation is at the very end. It's all linked together, my brothers and sisters. That is the awesomeness of our God, that he puts it all together for us there in terms that we can understand. As long as we spend time with him, study these scriptures, and try to learn what we're supposed to be learning. And at times we forget that. And uh, let's go now to verse 9. And the third angel, we speak about that a lot, the third angel. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, the beast and the image, who's that? Satan, right? That's the counterfeit. Worships the beast and his image and received his mark on his forehead and on his hand. So, is that what we talked about earlier? The counterfeit. We have God, the creator, and Satan, the counterfeit. What's important about a counterfeit? God, it looks like it, right? But it comes from the original, right? Where did Satan come from? He came from God. He was a created being. So that's what's important to see as well with a counterfeit. He comes from it, but it looks like it, but is not of it. And sometimes he will appear as an angel of light as well if we hear in some of the other scriptures. So he is the counterfeit, and he is attacking directly the creator by saying, worship me. Don't worship God. Worship the beast and his image and receive the mark that goes with it. But importantly, in verse 12, here is the patient of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Who are those individuals? Sorry? Is it us? Is it you? Is it me? By God's grace, right. <laughs> we got to have that hope, my brothers and sisters, that it is each and every one of us. Uh, we are the created beings. We are the individuals that should be keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. And let us not get tied up into all of that legalism uh, that's put out there. We keep the commandments because we love God, right? We don't keep the commandments because it's an obligation, because otherwise if we do it as an obligation, it is not sincere. It is not true. It is a counterfeit, much like what happened with Cain and Abel, right? Mm -hmm. We had one done out of love and sincerity and another one out of obligation. And what happened there? It led to sin. Uh, and so that's what can happen to us. But we've got to always remember the Sabbath always points us to the Creator. And importantly, why is this important? Because we're going to have, why do some individuals say, no, I'm not going to worry about the Sabbath. I'll worry about it when I get to heaven. Well, number one, you've got to be worried you might not make it to heaven, okay? Um, 
But it was mentioned, uh, I believe, in last week and the weeks before. Um, we should be honoring the Sabbath each and every week now. Isn't it a little difficult for you to practice something new that you've never done before? Yeah. Um, we should be getting used to being in the Sabbath each and every week um, because we can become accustomed to that and it becomes something that we love doing. Um, and I think that's another thing that we need to be concerned about at times when you hear those stories about like the left behind and all of those individuals. Uh, I remember hearing all of that and having discussions with individuals be before I became a Seventh-day Adventist. Um, there was always the thing that, oh, the left behind are going to have seven years to fix everything. Fix everything in their life. What happens when you give individuals time continually? They procrastinate. They wait until the end. Uh, I'm going to wait until not, I'm going to have seven years, but you know what? Even in those seven years, I'm going to wait till the last six months. And then it'll even get lower and say, well, I'll wait till the last month, the last week. The last day, maybe even the last hour before I fix things. And so those are individuals that are never accustomed to doing that. And so the Sabbath is something that we're going to have for eternity. And so why not have a little piece of eternity here on earth each and every week? Because that's what God gave to all of us. Uh, I think uh, Mark Finley put it in a way, I wrote it down. He said, it's our oasis in the desert. Um, and he said it's a work of Christ as opposed to Sunday, which is a work of man. And he says Sabbath is a palace in time. I really like that. It's a palace in time. It's an oasis in the desert. It's a place of refuge uh, that we can go to each and every week. It's a retreat. Um, and he put it there. It's a palace in, in time. Uh, it's a metaphor for paradise and a testimony to God's presence. Um, that is important. Because with the Sabbath, we recognize God as the creator and his presence. And so we should recognize his presence with each and every one of us here. It's an eternal symbol uh, of him as a creator and uh, of what is to come. Remember I mentioned moments ago, it's a hope. If you don't believe in God, you don't believe in the Sabbath, then what hope do we have? If we go through evolution, there is no hope. There's only death. As Pastor said, there's only death. There's no hope. But if you believe in God and believe in the Sabbath and that we're going to have eternity with God, then what does that mean? We have hope for something more, for something better. Did he not say that he will create a new one, a better one? We will all be transformed into something better than we are now. And so we're going to go forward. Any more? That's it? Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, so wrapping that up, uh, thank you, my brothers and sisters. Um, I think we all got the gist of all of this. Uh, the battle of the Sabbath and the end has to do with worship and worshiping our Creator and God. And so let us not be amiss of what is happening all around us each and every day, each and every week. And gladly, you all have chosen freely to be here on this blessed and holy Sabbath with a God who loves us. So may you all have a blessed and holy Sabbath. Amen.